A meeting will be recorded and proceedings will be conducted in accordance with the Council's constitution, including const procedural rules which are available on the Council's website. Item one, the emergency evacuation procedure. There's no planned evacuation drill this evening and accordingly, if the alarm sounds, it is to be treated as a genuine need to evacuate. There are emergency exits to my right and opposite the lifts where you may have come in. On exiting, you will be directed to the assembly point and it is important that you remain there and do not return to the building until I've announced that it is safe to do so. If anyone present will need assistance in evacuating, could you please inform me now so that we can make the necessary arrangements to assist you? This meeting determines the rights and obligations of the applicant and members must consider each applicant. Sorry, Councillor Clark, do you? Um, members must consider each application and everything that is said in the meeting concerning the application and make their decision based solely on their planning judgment of the information available to them. Following a decision by members, delegated authority is given to the planning officer to issue the decision notice. Planning permission is not granted or refused until the in, uh, issue of that decision notice. Any member of the council who is not a member of the planning committee may attend as a visiting member and may speak having given prior notification. I've had notification from councillor Carol Jackson. Such visiting members may of course include ward members, and whilst visiting members can speak on an application, they are not permitted to vote. Any member acting as a substitute on the planning committee must have undertaken appropriate training before doing so. Members must remain in the meeting for the whole time that each item is being debated and should not vote on that item unless they have done so. I would now like to welcome our public speakers and remind you that you have three minutes to speak and an audible warning of time will be given when there are 30 seconds remaining. If a meeting is deferred to conduct a site meeting, you may speak both at this meeting and at the site meeting, but there will be no further opportunity to speak on the matter when it comes back to the planning committee. The, the, the meeting will roughly follow the order set out in the agenda, and I will amend the order if there's good reason for doing so. In particular, I'll take any items where a member of the public has registered to speak first before moving on to the remainder of the agenda, and I will verbally reorder the agenda as appropriate. Item two, apologies for absence and substitutes. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have apologies from uh, Councillor Paul Stephen, Councillor uh, James Hall and Councillor Elliot Jays, who's substituted by Councillor Derek Carnell. Thank you. Uh, item three, minutes. This is to approve the minutes of a meeting held on the 9th of November 2023. Minute numbers 393 to 405 which is different to what's in your agenda as a correct record read lovely thank you um item four to invite member declarations of disclosable pecuniary interests under the localism act councillor golding yeah, I wish to declare a disclosable non-pecuniary interest in respect of items 3.1 and 3.2. Um, I am a member of uh, Faversham Society, but I've had no involvement in drafting objections to those two agenda items. OK, it's going to move on to the non-pecuniaries next, but OK. <laughs> any, not, any more non-pecuniaries? Nope. I'd like to remind the meeting that where it is possible that a fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, would conclude there is a real possibility that a member might be predetermined or biased on any agenda item. The member should declare this possibility and then leave the room while that item is considered. I will mention I am a member of Borden Parish Council and Bobbing Parish Council, both of which I believe have made comments on um, agenda items tonight. I took no part in the discussions on or all, all the decisions on either item. Um, uh, right, part B. So the first item is deferred item 1, 23 slash 502 slash 598 slash full um short pit one Hoisted road 
does the planning officer have a summary and update on this application? Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so the item relates to an application that was deferred on the 12th of October. The applications for a replacement fence along the western boundary of a former chalk pit. Uh, so this slide shows the red line site and the area marked in blue is the length of existing fencing that's to be replaced. And as a reminder, uh, that's along the side of Highstead Road. Slide shows images of the existing fence uh, in places the existing fence is failing and the proposal is to replace it. The new fence uh, would be green in colour and of a palisade style. Members resolve to defer making a decision in order for further discussions with the applicant, the parish council and ward councillor to take place as well as to consult with the active travel coordinator. The key concerns are around the appearance of the fence and its position. In terms of the position, in places the existing fence is quite close to the road, leaving little space for pedestrians to retreat to when cars travel along the road. To address that concern in terms of the location of the fence in relation to the road, the applicant is committed where the existing fence is located close to the road to setting the position of the proposed fence back one metre from the roadside. And a condition has been uh, recommended, Chair, to ensure the fence is set back as proposed. The consultation response from the Parish Council requested another option be considered for the fence, namely a type of fencing uh, produced by Jackson Fencing. And just for comparison purposes, purposes, this slide shows a palisade fence to the right and an example of the Jackson fencing to the left. The applicant has considered implications, which mean that it is not feasible for them to install the alternate fencing. So the palisade fencing is what's being proposed. Given the commitment to setting the fence back and subject to landscaping, Officers are of the view that the proposed fence would be acceptable in planning terms and approvals recommended. Thank you, Chair. OK. Um, do I have to move this? Yeah. OK, I'll move the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Booth. Seconding. Any comments? Councillor Winkless. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. They've gone away and listened. I seem to remember that uh, I requested along with other members that uh, it be painted green uh, to be environmentally friendly in appearance. Uh, they've actually gone away and come back and said they would do that. And I also said at that, also said at that meeting that uh, I was basically in favour of it, uh, subject to the colour being changed. So. I will be voting with the officers for acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I did speak against this at the last meeting. Um, it is good that the applicant, as Councillor Winkley said, has gone away and thought about this. Um, I hoped they would have thought about it a little more and come back with a better alternative. Um, however, um, they have agreed to move the, the fencing back by one metre from the roadside, so it won't be quite so prominent. And I believe there is some screening um, proposed, which will um, soften the, over time the palisade fencing. Um, but I still am a little lost as to why they want such a high security fencing along that piece of road. Um, because when you go two metres behind the fence and you've got a 30 foot drop um, and they cite um, um, people actually um, breaking into the property. Um, well, the actual, the easiest way for people to get into the chalk pit, um, and I know um, that a lot of people have or, and still do go in this way, is through the, when we looked at the picture, um, through the the field um, 
to the north west and to the northeast of the of the site. Um, so to say that they need palisade fencing for security along the side of the road, I still find a little um, difficult to accept. Um, but um, I I don't see how we with the um, with the changes they've made, how we can actually look at refusing this. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, one question I had is on the they set it back a, a meter. Uh, part of what was asked for was hopeful was uh, some planting in front of it. A condition six mentions prior to the erection of a fence, the precautionary mitigation strategy must be submitted for written approval. Strategy must include various things. I include plan of habitats, details of species likely to be present, etc. Um, <clears throat> I would like, if possible, that, that condition has to come back or it meets the satisfaction of a ward member or something so that we get a good um, good level of mitigation rather than just something that's a bit substandard. I don't know if there's a way that we can incorporate that within agreeing the condition. Yeah. <laughs> so incorporating it into the condition, it might be quite challenging to include that. We, of course, have the schema delegation that sets out the officer's delegation and members do receive a weekly list of applications that includes submission of details. So should the ward member want to be involved in that application, they can, of course, approach the case officer at the time to be made aware of the application and discuss it further. Can we call in on, an, on call in the condition mitigation? I don't think they can. That's delegated to officers. Mm. OK. Anybody else? OK, so I'll move the officer. Oh, Councillor Booth, just caught my eye in time. No, that, that's fine. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I applaud the applicant in engaging with the council. I uh, applaud um, the steps that they've taken. I, I think this is a absolutely standard level of fencing that we see thousands of miles miles of across Kent. They've taken reasonable uh, precautions to protect their property. Clearly, um, I think we have no grounds whatsoever other than to. Uh, abide by the officer's recommendation to approve. Thank you. OK, there's nobody else, so we'll go to the vote. Those in favour, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. eight OK, that's uh, unanimous. Right, I think we go to 2.2 .2 next which is 23 slash 503 582 slash ADV land at Wise's Lane. And do we have an officer update, please? Yeah, thanks, Chairman, evening, everybody. Um, there's no update to the report for this one, so I'll launch straight into the presentation. Um, so this is an application for adverse advertisement consents um, for a number of different adverts. Um, I'll quickly read out the list. One fascia sign, nine totem signs, two plaques, four fence panel signs, one development name sign and five flagpoles. Um, they relate to the Wises Lane um, mixed use mixed use development, um, which obviously benefits from planning permission. Um, the adverts are split over three sites, so I'll um, zoom in a little bit on that. So the bulk of the adverts proposed here and, and which are also retrospective um, because they're in, in situ um, relate to the um, sales centre and the two show home plots, which are um, where the site essentially sort of starts where it meets um, Wise's Lane. Um, this the smaller number of adverts are proposed in front of two dwellings here and then further to the south. There are two signs proposed here just for reference this road doesn't exist yet it's the link road that's got planning permission but 
is um, that part of the link road isn't in receipt of reserve matters consent. So um, that's that's indicative at this point. Um, but the adverts are proposed there adjacent to that link road. Um, in terms, zoom out again. In terms of those three sites, um, I won't spend too much time on this slide because the pictures um, show it better. But th this is the the site on the left is the is the sales centre where the main main bulk of the application relates to. Top right is the um, is the site in front of houses which have been constructed, and bottom right is um, the two signs that are adjacent to where the link road is. Um, well, will will be located in time, subject to reserve matters consent. So this is a sort of run through of the of the various adverts which are which are proposed here. Um, various totem signs. Small signs which are which are located on um, two of the two of the show homes. Uh, these are the the fence panel signs. As we can see that's the that's the name of the development, and and these are the flagpoles. Uh, well, on the rest of those too long. Um, in terms of the in terms of the adverts which are in situ, this is this is the sales centre, and as you can see, there's a mixture of totem signs, flagpoles, fence panels. Um, fascia boards there, etc. The close-up view of that of that last photo. Front of the constructed houses on the on the second site is the two flagpoles and the um, and the one totem sign, and this is a photograph of the current um, current state of play in terms of where the the third site is. Um, as you can see, obviously, as just discussed, the link road doesn't exist yet. Um, as per the report, it's it's considered that the adverts are, are fairly commonplace on developments like this. Um, it's a temporary consent which is sought for three years, which is controlled by condition. And in terms of these two adverts um, on the third site next to the future link road, there's a condition which um, essentially states that those adverts can't be um, put in place until the link road's open and um, open to traffic. Um, so that's to sort of mitigate against two signs just being placed sort of in in what is currently open countryside um so yeah the the recommendation is for um consent to be granted thank you very much thank you um we have the speaker una kerrigan is for the agent on this floor it's a red button and members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight in support of the application which seeks advertisement consent for the installation of signage and flagpoles associated with the development site Land at Wises Lane, also known as Applegate Park. The intention of the proposed signage is to direct visitors to the sales area on site, assisting with wayfinding and access. This helps to manage traffic to the site and reduce the potential for impacts on neighbouring residents. The signs are further essential to assist with the sale of homes on the development, particularly given the site's location away from some of the main thoroughfares in the area. The advertisements are considered proportionate, taking into account the scale of the development and would not result in undue clutter or an over-proliferation of signs. They are of an appropriate scale and design and positioning, given their type and purpose, with a darker, more muted colour scheme proposed. None of the signs would be illuminated and are modest when compared to the signage on other development sites. No concerns are raised by the Council's Environmental Protection Officer in terms of amenity impact, nor by KCC Highways. Temporary consent is sought, which would only allow for the signs to be installed for a period of three years from the date of the permission. Any perceived impact would therefore be limited to a temporary period. Your officers are recommending that the application be approved subject to a number of conditions. Condition 7 states that the signage in the area known as Site 3, positioned to the east of Wises Lane, near the current site compound parking, must not be installed until the link road for the development is open in its entirety to traffic. However, due to the timescales for delivery of the development, the link road will not be open and operational before the three-year advertisement period has expired. Condition 7 would therefore prevent the signage at Site 3 from being installed. The signage includes a Section 106 sign advising residents of the community contributions the developer is making as part of the development. The sign is pro it proposed in response to suggestions made by the Wises Lane Monitoring Group, a working group of board and parish council whom we regularly meet. 
The sign is located here as this area experiences a high level of footfall from local residents. It also appears in the context of the adjacent site compound and not within the context of the immediate countryside as suggested in the report. Since the sign responds to a specific local request, we therefore ask members to remove condition seven. In summary, the proposal seek advertisement consent for modest signage and flags associated with the sales area at Land at Wises Lane. The signage has been carefully considered in the context of the surrounding area and will assist visitors in accessing the site, limiting impacts on residents. Your officers have recommended the application for approval, and we hope that you are able to support this application and, and grant permission accordingly, whilst also removing the requirement for conditions that Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Yeah, I'll move the officer's recommendation. Councillor Booth, thank you. Um, debate. Anybody wish to speak on this one? Councillor Winkless. Uh, thank you again, Chair. Um, yet again, I can't see we've got any reason to turn this down. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't see we've got any objections to this. Um, I was set for the parish council uh, objected. And I think it's been said before by members, uh, the parish council very often object Sometimes I don't come along and speak speak against it. So basically, I'm over the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, whilst you've got that particular image up, um, this is this is the one one of the ones that's causing a bit of concern. In wind, that makes quite a bit of noise, and it is residential. Um, <clears throat> flapping. There's three of these um, flappy, I don't know what they're called really, or oh, flappy, flappy adverts, which don't seem to do much to draw attention to or serve a purpose in drawing attention to the site, given that you've got a big board already. I'm just wondering if three is really necessary. Um, the other one that people are irked about, I don't know if you've got a, a close up of it, but it's the one that says you have missed us. Yeah, that's it. Um, people do think there is a bit more to Balden and the area than the development. And that if you are heading in towards the village, you may not feel that you've missed it. So that one does, you know, that, that wording is a little uh, offensive, really. Um, it indicates that the only reason you might want to be there is to look at the new housing. So I, I do have concerns about that one. And uh, is there really a need for three at the other site? I mean, they put them up without permission and now asking retrospective. Had we <coughs> had they put them in before they'd put them up? Might we have said two should be appropriate? I'm always a bit annoyed when people put in um, retrospective planning applications. So that, those have been my concerns. The fact that you, do you nearly need three given the noise they create, and can we can we get the wording? Can we agree the wording or say what is the appropriate wording? Because I don't think we're actually agreeing the wording. By giving permission, but we are giving permission for the adverts, which is okay. It's just the wording. Councillor Henderson. Say, but my understanding is that there was no, there were no serious objections to this, um, and. We need to decide upon the application before us. And uh, I, I do not see that um, you or anyone else has raised uh, an objection which would be valid to turn down the application which is before us. So um, I, uh, I would also intend to uh, uh, support the uh, officer's recommendation. Councillor Hunt. Thanks. I, I think these are normal signs that you get on any other development. The flags are always something that's there. 
um, the wording on there, I think I can understand what, what you're saying about there's more to it, but but it's not that sort of sign. It's a sign for people that are looking to buy housing. And if you've driven past that and you want to buy a house, you've missed it. So I think it is for what they are wanting to do with advertising for development is is the right word. And I'm, I don't think in planning terms we can change the word in any way. I do understand about the free flags. And I think if there is anything in planning terms, it would be because the amount of clutter that's there and they're being free. But the report and the officer considers that, yeah, that that isn't a, an issue with there, and I, I think I would agree with the officers on that. And again, you get those those flags on on developments, and having three of them there, although probably while well, we might not think it's great, the harm needs to be considered. Um, and does removing one make any difference? Probably not. And I do understand with the noise, and if there is residents living right next door to that and they are flapping about that is a bit of a concern um that that could just be something maybe the officers can comment on um, but apart from that noise i can't see any reasons to refuse it oh yeah i'll comment on those two points um firstly i'll deal i'll deal with the wording first because that's the easy one um 7.2 of the report um sets out that um basically the the content of the advert isn't isn't a matter that we can deal with um so we wouldn't be able to um you know refuse it on on those grounds in ter in terms of the three flags um we have consulted environmental health because one of the things that we were you know we wanted to consider was um potential noise impacts they haven't objected um but something for members to perhaps consider is that for advert consents you can issue split decisions um different to planning applications whereby you either you know, approve it or refuse it. Um, so you can determine that certain adverts are acceptable and certain others aren't um, and still issue the decision. Uh, officer's view is that the three flags don't give rise to any harm to, to visual amenity, but obviously it's a, you know, it's a member's call, but just something to bear in mind when, you know, considering the item. Do you want to come back, Councillor? I come back on that because I think from what's been said about removing one of them, don't think it makes any difference. If they were all to be removed, I think that does then make a difference. And I, I guess it's looking at the, the one that's the photo that's on the screen at the moment. If there's that amount of clutter with all of those signage there, um, having the three flags removed would probably help with the amenity of the area. Um, and it would also help with any noise concerns. So if it's a split decision, maybe I'm happy to propose that those three flags are removed um, for the interest in amenity due to the amount of signage in one area um, causing issues to the look and appearance of the street scene. It oh. Yeah, it was just to say that because we haven't got any evidence in terms of noise and um, that it is causing harm and we haven't got an objection from environmental health, I'd, I'd steer away from using that as the basis for refusing the flags if that's what members considered was a, an appropriate way forward. But the points about, um, you know, over proliferation and visual harm caused by the, the number of adverts, which is, you know, for, you know, if you thought it was exacerbated by those flags, that would be sort of, you know, something which would be, um, Know, appropriate in, in in planning terms. If I, if I can come back, that that's exactly what I was saying. But I just if there is concerns and noise, the flags aren't there. That that concern has been removed, even if we don't use that as a reason for the refusal on those. Okay. Do we have a second of that proposal? Yeah. Bill Clark. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to that proposal, or should we to remove remove the three flags? In second. OK, so we can we vote on the amendment to remove the three flags. Those in favour, please indicate. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Those against? One, two, three, four. I didn't vote. Uh, I voted four. 
for the amendment. Um, okay, so that passed. So we're now talking about the substantive without those three flags. Councillor Booth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I'll come back to the initial statement, which I find a little concerning. Um, we can't find any reasons to turn this down. Um, respectfully, that's not what we're here for. We are not here to turn everything down. That's the first point. Second point is um, be careful what you wish for. Um, this council has a uh, perpetual habit of approving large scale developments. Um, so this is going to become commonplace. The only signal uh, this council should be sending out to the applicants is make sure your application includes advertising. Because no, retrospective is a is a strong word, but it is not a condition or a reasonable um, opportunity to turn it down. Um, invariably, it does not stand just because it's retrospective. No, I don't like it in, in the time that I've been involved with planning. Um, I detest some of it. It does really jar um, because invariably you have to look at it as if this came to us as a fresh application, would you approve it? Um, I see no reason to not approve it. Um, I see no reason to remove the flags, hence the way I voted on that. Uh, I'm happy with it uh, and let's move on. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Thompson. I was going to speak probably for future points on that. Those flags tend to disintegrate. Um, in the motor industry, they generally replace them annually. They're generally a plastic product, so they end up pretty much everywhere. Um, also, the boards for future reference, are they recyclable? What are they made of? Because again, that's more landfill product, single use. So just to points really, flags flags tend to always disintegrate fairly quickly. Do, do we know if they're a biodegradable product or anything, Paul? I, I don't know. Um, that, I mean, the, in terms of a application for advert consent, there's only two things we can consider, and that's amenity and public safety. Um, so we can't, you know, we can, we can take into account the sustainability of the adverts themselves. Although, you know, I agree if if they came in with a, you know, with a product that was recyclable, that would be that would be a good thing. But we but we couldn't deal with that under the terms of the application. Okay, then. I see. Uh, Councillor Speed. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just to mention that um, the agent did put in a request that um, condition seven is removed, and we haven't actually discussed that yet. Um, as I understand it, the permission is for three years, and that road won't be constructed for three years, and therefore it's a rather meaningless permission to grant because they wouldn't be allowed to actually put those signs up. So I'm wondering if we should amends the time scale in section seven. Um, comments on that one, Paul? It seems to me that it really ought to put a separate application in for that one. It'd make more sense, wouldn't it? Yes, yeah, as, as I said in the opening um, presentation, the um, the reason for the condition was so that we didn't have adverts placed essentially in a mainly open and und un undeveloped part of the site, excuse me, um, which could could give rise to some visual harm. Um, so that condition was put on. I mean, I accept it's that there's obviously a good chance the road won't be there within three years. I, I don't know that for sure. Um, but if that is the case and they can't put the adverts in, then the time that the road is um, is uh, is constructed that, you know, they'd need to they need to apply again at that point, but I think that condition, you know, does an important job in terms of mitigating against potential harm. Okay, Councillor Hunt. So on on that point of the condition, I, I can't see that removing it's going to do anything because, as you say, if the road is is built in three years, then that condition's there. If it's not built in three years, then no signs don't go up, and they'll have to put permission any, anyway for another one. So. Okay, so there's not a proposal to move um, 
condition seven, so we'll leave that in. OK, if there's nobody else, those in favour of the application, please, uh, as amended, please show. Are you there or not, aren't you now? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Those against? Three and abstentions. There shouldn't be any. Right. Okay, that one has been passed. Now we now go to 2.4. Which is uh, 23 slash 500, 616 slash full. One Newell would walk west. And does the, the officer have a update, please? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, there is no update on this application. Radio. Um, sorry, just, sorry, yeah. just yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to do two things at the same time and struggling. Just trying to get that better. Right, here we go. Um, so this is an application for a two-storey side extension to a property at um, number one Norwood Walk West, which is within the built confines of Sittingbourne. It's the site location plan, so members can see it is currently a end of terrace property surrounded by other residential properties. Um, the house is currently in use as a, a house in multiple occupation and I just draw members attention to paragraph 7.6 of the report which sets out that um, use as a HMO or a small HMO I should say um, does not require planning permission um, if you've changed that use from a from a single dwelling to a small HMO that's that's permitted development essentially. Um, this is the existing and proposed site plans, um, so members can see in red the uh, location of the extension on the property. Um, the extension is approximately 12 and a half metres away from the property at number 44 Norwood Walk um, and approximately 16 metres from the properties to the rear. This is the existing layout of the property. Um, so members can see there are four current rooms in use as HMOs, including the um, attic, which was converted under again under permitted development. And that's the existing property with the dormer extension that's being built. This is the proposal. Um, so members can see that. There is a communal lounge diner proposed on the ground floor with an additional bedroom at first floor level. Uh, you'll note that the um, extension is set back slightly from the front of the property. It's 3.7 metres in width and it retains a distance of approximately three metres to the boundary, to the side boundary, sorry, I should say. These are the elevations of the property, so members can see that the extension has a hipped roof. Um, that's actually um, somewhat of a feature in the area where the blocks of terraces have hip turn elements to, to, to the ends of them. Some photographs. Um, the main areas um, obviously for consideration are um, impact on street scene, visual appearance, um, officers consider that the extension is uh, modest in proportion to the existing property um, and sits comfortably within the street scene. Uh, the other issue, um, residential amenity, um, particular considerations being given to the relationship with the end of terrace property that you can see on the left hand side. That property directly faces the flank wall of the existing property at the moment. So the extension would bring the building closer to that property. Um, there's a distance, as I said earlier, of 12 and a half metres. You'll also see that the property sits at a slightly lower land level to the application site. Um, officers have carried out a light test on that property and 
um, the extension passes passes that light test with a hipped roof. Um, so officers consider that that relationship is is acceptable. That's the back of the property. Again, you can see um, the dwellings to the to the right of the extension, um, and you can see actually there that the M property has a has a hipped roof. And again, sort of looking back up towards Norwood Walk. That's the light test that officers have carried out. Um, that's taken into account the difference in land levels between the um, the application site and the property. It looks slightly unusual because we've had to plot it on the existing elevations, but essentially that point there is the distance um, between the extension and the neighbouring property. And that level there is the um, essentially the difference in land level of a metre between the two properties. So I'd refer members to the um, to the main report. Um, thank you. OK, I'd like to ask uh, Jane Clay, who is attending remotely, to speak on this. Are you there? Yes, I am. OK, you have three minutes. You'll have a 30 second warning uh, when you've got 30 seconds left. OK, OK, thank you. Good evening. The history of this property incorporates a loft extension built under permitted development in 2019. At the same time, an application was made to add a two storey, three bedroom house to the end of the property. After much objection to both developments, it was a relief to see the application for the new house withdrawn and the loft extension come under scrutiny. You may also note from planning records that other end of terraces have historically had permission refused in this specific walkway for similar projects which affect the neighbouring properties. A two storey extension is just as bulky as an additional house and not in keeping with the area. The application's design and access statement includes examples of similar projects around the area. These examples do not have the same detrimental impact an extension to number one would have. The distance between the neighbouring properties of these examples are much further apart with roads between them and appearing more suitable for the area. They are also built on a level surface rather than on a hill, preventing the feeling of neighbouring properties from being towering, towered over. Further development on our walkway, situated on a hill structure, is overbearing, with only a footpath separating neighbouring properties on all sides. Numbers 44 and 46 Norwood Walk will have a blank wall in closer proximity to their windows. Furthermore, the residents in Woolwich Road to the rear of Norwood Walk are set much lower due to the nature of the hill. With the loft extension in place, these properties are unreasonably overlooked. To add a further extension to the side amplifies this. As noted in your committee papers, the rear of the properties of Woolwich Road and Norwood Walk are less than the recommended 21 metres apart. Although this has always been the case, further development simply fills any empty space which ordinarily improves the situation. And by allowing an extension, it feels like up to date recommendations are ignored, setting a precedent and reducing the already limited open view forever. By refusing the application, this will set the best example for the future. Residents of Norwood Walk are often victims of a number of drainage issues. We acknowledge seconds. Southern Water may not identify an issue. However, over time, residents have bought necessary equipment to resolve blockages themselves. So not all cases will have been logged with Southern Water. Please do take into consideration the impact an additional bathroom will have on the system to the detriment of the neighbours further up the drainage chain. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I called this in. I am predisposed, but I'm not predetermined and will be obviously listening to the debate. Um, Councillor Kavanagh is the ward member. You have three minutes. I'm speaking. I'll give it afterwards, don't I? Carry on, Councillor Kavanagh. 
I'll, I'll start again. My three minutes start again, please. I'm speaking against the proposal to extend the HMO in Norwood Walk. Grove Park Estates later phases, like many such estates, were built with greater housing density, including Norwood Walk. The planning officer's report mentions that the rear of this property is already closer to the rear of Woollett Road than the recommended distance, yet suggests that increasing the, the amount of the house this close shouldn't be problematic. It will be problematic. It is already problematic, especially due to the fact that this property is somewhat higher than its neighbour in Woollett Road. And the loft conversion several years ago only made the dominating nature of the property worse. Already this building is not in keeping with the rest of the immediate area. Housing is of two storey, two to three bed houses. If this application is approved, it will make this house a three storey, five or six bedroom house. The earlier inaccurate existing layout only showed two bedrooms, although what was originally lab labelled as a lounge was already used as a bedroom. Plus, of course, the unmentioned bedroom in the loft, making it a four bedroom house. Even though the plans only give one additional bedroom, I suspect that the proposed living room dining area will also be used as a bedroom, making it a six bedroom house with possibly at least one car per bedroom due to public transport being very poor in the area. Although there is one parking space allocated to the property, to date it has not been available for the tenants. Parking is always an issue in the area as most houses have more than one car and no road at the front of the property. So some vehicles park in Woollett Road turning circle, which makes access for the bin lorries and emergency vehicles very difficult, if not impossible. Regarding the main sewer in the garden where the extension is planned, it was found recently that official plans do not reflect exactly what is in position underground. And there is a mismatch of different bore of sewers. It is well known that the drainage system locally is insufficient and prone to problems. Access for building work. The only access for builders and their equipment materials is through an alley. This alley is the route used by people coming to get their primary school children to Grove Park School. It is also the route used by residents of Norwood Walk and beyond to reach the road. We all know from the previous extension into the roof how disruptive this was, as well as the difficulty travelling safely through the alley whilst the builders were there. Their vehicles or their building supplies tended to be parked up on the grass verge. This verge is still compacted and the daffodils planted to enhance the appearance of the area where they have survived grow short and stunted. Other air houses in the area have had extensions, but their situations are not the same as this property. For example, access for builders through a gate through the back garden from a garage access area, giving no need to use the path outside for any building work. OK, thank you. Um, now I move the officer's recommendation. It is actually on my, on my guide here. OK, any speakers? Councillor Watson. Chairman, I will be very brief. Um, although I do live five, ten minutes walk from uh, this property, um, I can understand why they've put objections in the local residents. I would take uh, a walk down to the Meads um, Woods, down that way, down Norwood Walk, and it is it is on a hill. I can assure you, I know it's on a hill when I get to the top because I normally need an oxygen cylinder. But it's a it's quite a narrow pathway. Um, my concerns would be with the construction work that's being done. But probably one of the main problems that there is in this area is parking. Parking is an absolute nightmare. Hilton Drive, Nor Norwood and Clive Road, where we've got Grove Park School just around the corner. Um, and parking, as I said, is an absolute nightmare. And hell, there's never been an accident there yet. I do not understand. Um, so I think we do have to look at this one with um, quite a bit of consideration to be taken in for the local residents. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Winkless. Oh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can the officer just put the paragraph up, please, of the actual corner there? This. OK, I do have concerns, um, which has been mentioned by the previous two speakers, that if that's extended, that's going to go quite close to that footpath and the houses opposite 
I think it could be quite intrusive. Can the officer say that if the the wall that's be facing the houses on the side of the path, does that be a, a, no windows on that side? Andy? Yeah, I've just put the um, plan up um, so you can see no windows in the flank wall. Um, I look oh, I can like, speak up a bit. I can't, can't hear. Yeah, no, win no windows in the in the side wall. Um, I'd also add that the window in the rear is to be obscure glazed because that serves a bathroom. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. So I do have reservations about it, but I will listen to the rest of the debate before I make my mind up. Thank you. Okay. Um, Councillor Boo. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, on, on a similar vein, I'd, I'd look at 7.13. 7.15 and 7.16. Um, I'm just a little perplexed as to why in the report it makes very clear, example 713, there is no direct overlooking. However, it says there's a potential impact and that's repeated on 15 and 16, the potential impact. I would like to know um, from the officer's professional capacity what weight he would give to that line potential impact. Andy? Uh, I think you're referring to the italics, is that right? I mean, that's essentially just the heading to assess the potential impact on surrounding properties, which is something that we do with with all applications it's not it's not concluding that there is an unacceptable impact it's just simply head, a heading to say this is what the assessment is now going to consider councillor booth yeah thank you you've identified the uh, exact wording i was looking for which is the uh, unacceptable impact thank you that makes it very clear councillor clark yeah, thank you chairman um, I find myself in a bit of a quandary because I'm looking to agree with Councillor Booth and that must be a, the second or third occasion I've agreed with him recently. <laughs> um, yeah, the this development, um, in my view, is a significant overdevelopment of what is a fairly modest end of terrace house or was I should say, a fairly modest end of terrace house. Um, I know we're discussing just the side extension at the moment, but for, from what I recall from dormer window extensions, if that had come before us at this meeting, we would be looking to turn it down because under, I believe, um, SBC supplementary planning guidance, um, boxed dormer windows must be at least 0.5 of a metre up from the plate, might be the eaves of the building, and they must be at least 0.5 of a metre down from the ridge line. So we've already got an overdevelopment of the uh, property as it is under permitted development rights um, to now add a two storey um, side development to this. Um, my personal view, it's a significant overdevelopment of the site. Um, and I'm, I will end there, but I will be looking at ways and reasons that we could possibly refuse this application. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hunt. And um, what's been said there on overdevelopment side, and we've had it lots of times before, but what is the impact of that overdevelopment? I think that's the thing we're going to need to consider if you do look at fusing it. But I, looking at it, is I understand with some of the parking and different bits and pieces, and it is a bit of a strange place, but the parking already exists. And I think it was it's going to be that argument of what does this actual part do to, to increase that? And I'm, I'm not sure we got anywhere to go on that one. The concern I had looking at it was that it does go, is, is imposing to 44 and 46. Um, but Councillor Winkers didn't didn't ask for enough photos. Um, and have we got a photo at all looking the other way um, from, from the back of, so rather than looking down, 
looking back again. That that one there was a good one. Uh, no, back. That's the one. There's a property fur just up in the distance there, which is still Norwood Walk. And look, looking on the maps, that end of the property there is looking from this direction juts out more than the, the two properties closer. Seems the distance from that wall to the properties opposite is about 10 metres. Um, and because of that, I don't think the um, the distance between that flank wall to 44 and 46, is that 14 or 16 metres? 12.6 metres. I mean, because there's other properties that are closer to those properties, um, we have a difficulty to say that they, these are going to be causing an impact from this extension onto to those properties. And I think because of the roof that's been consideration has been given to, to hit that roof down at the side to we've looked at how the light and everything will have an impact on those properties. So although I can see it's probably not the, the most ideal situation, I can't see that there would be any reason to refuse it. So I think the officers, um, I would go with the officers on this one. OK, um, I know the area quite well. I used to walk up at school a few years ago. Um, I, I think it's hard to get a, an idea of the impact from diagrams and even the photos. I don't like doing this, <laughs> but I'm going to. I'm going to propose a site visit if I have a seconder, because I think. Uh, I think that it might be beneficial. So it's been proposed and seconded, um, but anyone like to speak to the proposal for a site visit? Okay, Councillor Winkler. I'll just briefly, yes, I'm totally in favour of a site visit. I think it, on this one, it would be certainly to our advantage to get an actual picture of it, obviously on site. Thank you. Okay, I'll move the uh, site visit. or. To I propose that we defer for a site visit. Um, seconded by Councillor Watson. Those in favour, please show. I'm sure we can arrange that, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Those against? One, two, uh, abstention, uh, against. Uh, sorry, are you against or abstaining? Against, right, three against. So we shall take a trip to Norwood Walk. Um, next one is 2.520 slash 501573 slash full Nichols Transport Yard. Um, can I have a update from the officer, please? Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, there's no update um, to give members. Um, I'll give you a presentation. So um, this is a slightly unusual site and a slightly unusual situation. Um, this is the application site, Lidbrook Close. Um, it used to be um, Nichols, Haulage Yard, and before that, I understand it was a, a chalk pit. And access to the site is from the north here, um, off of Lidbrook Close, off of London Road. Um, the site, given its past history, is actually at much lower land level than most of its surroundings. So um, you have Adelaide Drive here, Hobart Gardens here, and Borden Lane here all of which are a considerable distance um, in land level terms above um, the level of, of the site. Towards the north where the site meets Lidbrook Close, um, the land levels in this area are um, roughly similar to properties on Lidbrook Close. And then here, these properties here rise in this direction. Um, so again, the levels progressively um, change as you as you move through the site here. 
Now, um, I'll, I'll give you um, some more detailed background on this site. If I could just refer members, first of all, to paragraphs 2.10 to 2.13 of the report. That sets out what is quite an unusual planning history here. So um, permission was granted originally in outline form in 1997 for residential development of the site. And then reserve matters approval was granted in 2001 for 49 dwellings. And at the time, all the relevant pre-commencement conditions were discharged and the foundations for one unit were constructed. Um, the works were then essentially covered and the site continued in its long-standing use as a, as a haulage yard. And the council at the time um, sought and received a legal opinion which confirmed that the development had been commenced and that it was possible to um, continue with the existing use and go back and undertake the development at a later date. And essentially confirmation was given to the developer at the time that the development had been lawfully commenced. So the haulage yard use carried on for a number of years. Um, that ended about, I think, five or six years ago. Um, the um, site was sold to Moat Housing, who are the, the applicants. Um, and Moat uh, decided to carry on with the, the development that had been had been historically granted. Um, but during the course of the construction, it became evident that um, they had quite significantly raised land levels in parts of the site, um, which was materially different to the to the levels that had been approved historically under the, the planning permissions. Um, so an application has been received to make a minor material amendment to the reserved matters application that was granted in 2001. Um, and the effect of that is obviously to consider the changes that have been made um, essentially to the site levels. They're also related landscaping and drainage changes as well. Um, but it's important to note that obviously there is an extant permission on the site um, and there is a fallback position if permission is refused that um, the development can go ahead in accordance with the planning permission. It's also important to note which is set out in paragraph 7.2 and 7.3 that the permission the permission that was granted historically doesn't include a raft of things that we would now normally require a residential development to provide. So there was no section 106 agreement that provided infrastructure contributions and affordable housing and so on. Those matters aren't for consideration now under the application that's been submitted. Um, this is essentially seeking specific changes to the approved scheme and we can't go back and revisit the whole development again. Um, the one point I would make though is that moat housing are on the site as members I'm sure know, they're a local affordable housing provider um, and they have bought this site to provide a wholly affordable housing development on the site. So whilst affordable housing isn't coming forwards in what we'd expect the usual way through the terms of a planning permission and a legal agreement, it is going to be, it will contribute towards affordable housing um, within the borough. So apologies for the the long background there, but I think it was probably important just to give a, a bit of context to to the application. Um, so um, this aerial photo is the the site as it as it was as a haulage yard, um, and this aerial photo um, is as it as it currently is at the moment um, with the housing development that's that's taken place. This is the site plan of the approved scheme. And this is the site plan as proposed and to all intents and purposes, bar a couple of very minor changes, the, the layout is essentially the same. Um, so the proposal, sorry, I'll go back to the approved site plan because um, I should give you some more information on the levels changes. So in terms of in terms of levels changes, here's the entrance from Libbrook Close. The, the levels here. Um, 
have been raised roughly by between 100 mils and 250 mils. Um, the levels in this part of the site down here. Sorry, actually, can we have that in recognisable measures? Uh, 100 to 250 millimetres. I can't, I can't go imperial, I'm afraid, but um, yeah. Yep, yeah, thank you. Four to eight inches uh, for those of us. This, this area here has actually, um, uh, the level's gone, the, the level has reduced. So that's um, about 700 millimetres. Um, and then progressively, as you go through the site, the levels have been raised to a point where, where you get to this part of the site here, the difference is about 1.8 metres. Um, so the land levels have been raised by by 1.8 meters here. And this is um, the landscape plan and levels plan that shows. So if you if you remember, I said that the site was considerably lower than surrounding um, uh, surrounding roads and surrounding properties. Um, this is part of a landscaping scheme, which also includes the um, levels changes and the way that the banks are being managed and that's through a combination of things sorry that's through a combination of things it includes some gabion walls here um, there are retaining walls that um, have been and are being built along this boundary and there are other areas where the, the bank is um, uh, graded without without the need for um, specific retaining measures Um, and then in terms of landscaping, the um, proposal, so because a lot of work's been done to the banks um, uh, and uh, as a result of the levels changes, um, the previous scheme included landscaping proposals around the perimeter of the site. Um, those have needed to be changed um, and the application includes a range of landscaping measures on the bank um, and also within the development itself. These are the photographs of the site. So um, that's the site entrance. Um, this is the closest property on Lidbrook Close, which sits just at a slightly lower level than the immediate properties that have been built next to it. These are photos of the boundary with Borden Lane. Um, so members can see that um, in the majority of cases, um, the development is two storeys and the first floor looks out onto the bank or onto the fence line. There are a couple of isolated um, areas where housing has three storeys and there is more of a um, overlooking relationship with neighbours. Um, so um, you've got this block here, which does have windows in the top floor that look towards properties on Borden Lane, but at a distance of um, some 50 metres. This is the relationship with Adelaide Drive. Um, and again, they're all two storey properties that essentially face the, um, the fence line in the bank. And then this is the boundary with Hobart Gardens. Um, and there is one property here, which I wasn't able to take a full picture of, but that this building here is a three story building and again because of the change in levels, particularly at this end of the site, there is more of a intervisibility between the back of this property and the properties on Hobart Gardens. Um, but again, that distance is in excess of 30 metres and well in excess of our, our usual um, privacy standards that we'd apply. Um, the landscaping proposals would obviously also um, add further screening opportunities along the banks. So taking those factors into account, um, officers consider that the amendments are acceptable and the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Can I ask Anne Smith to speak, please? Uh, push for red 
the button with a little red sticker when you get three minutes. Object to permission being granted as it does not include any screening at plots three to five. Block three is only 17.3 metres from the nearest neighbouring house. When the new boundary fence was installed, all existing trees and bushes were removed from both sides of the old fence. The land remaining between the new fence and the fences of plot three to five was subsequently filled with concrete path, increasing the level by approximately 12 inches. This is where screening should be. This planning application covers additional screening at the boundary to Borden Lane, where the houses are 50 metres away, which is considerably more than the 17 metres at plot three. Also included is planting south of plots 30 to 33 to ensure views are screened of gardens of existing properties. Why are we not being given the same consideration at plots three to five? These houses tower over our houses and gardens. The position of the houses has been altered because when the developers came to implement the drawings of the plans, they discovered that the land available was actually less than on the plan. Then, instead of reducing the number of houses from three to two, the three garages were omitted and replaced with standing space only. This allowed for plot three to be moved over onto the garage space, which resulted in an erasure of our privacy even more. This is why screening is so important at plots three to five. If you came and saw the view we have from our house and garden, you would agree also. It is the council's duty to consider the impact on neighbours, and that is what we have been asking of Swell Council since both Nichols and Moat acquired this site. Thank you. Thank you. Can you uh, just all illust Andy, illustrate plots three and four on that map for us, please? For the top left hand yeah. corner. So um, I, I believe the lady that just spoke would have been at possibly number 23 or 25. The book 23, 25. Okay. So um those are the properties so i've lost my mouse okay whilst well, you do i'll move the officer's recommendation secondly councillor booth councillor clark thank you chairman um, i find myself in situation of wearing two hats here one as a planning committee member and one as a ward member can you make sure which one you're which hat you're wearing i am wearing my hat as a Planning Committee member. Very good. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members, before I start, for your information, this site is uh, currently under an enforcement investigation for several um, misdemeanours um, in and around the site. Um, so I don't see why we are actually looking at this um, application this evening. Um, at the chairman's briefing, I did request that it was removed from the agenda, um, but I was told that it needed to come before the before the committee this evening. Um, this development has been problematic from its first incarnation in 1997 and is still proving so some 25 years later. <clears throat> the first contractor that started the development in 2019 went bankrupt after the COVID pandemic and the site lay dormant for quite a considerable amount of time whilst Moat Housing looked for the new contractor to finish the site. At the end of October this year, Councillor Cheeseman and myself were contacted by residents of Lidbrook Close, and when we met with them, they raised issues with us, including site levels, excess rubble and debris remaining on the site, and surface and foul water drainage causing fl flooding to their front gardens, as well as many other issues. Um, which I'll discuss tonight because it's just the site levels and landscaping. Um, these included, which have been alluded to, um, the orientation of um, the houses at plots three to five, um, 
and the distances from the boundaries of existing properties around the site and many other issues. Following this meeting, I wrote to Charlotte Hudson, um, posing many questions, including whether the site was due for completion and first occupation. The reply was completion should be at the end of March for occupation starting in April 2024. I then wrote to Charlotte again, copying in Joanne Johnson, requesting an urgent meeting between myself, Councillor Cheeseman, Charlotte, a senior planning officer, an inspector from STG Building Control, and senior representatives from Moat Housing in order to address the issues that were raised with us. This meeting, however, was denied. Um, Charlotte informed me that she had reported my concerns to the enforcement team to open an investigation. Then suddenly, out of the blue, this application pops up on the agenda, um, the one that we're now discussing. Um, this appears extremely suspicious that less than three weeks after contacting Charlotte and Joanne, this application is before us. This smacks of desperation on the part of Moat Housing, who now want to regularise their mistakes in order to keep their timetable to start letting in April 2024. Our officers term this um, application as minor material amendments. I would contend that a change of levels, perhaps 100 millimetres, could be considered as minor. However, a change in levels of 1.8 metres is not minor at all, but a major and deliberate breach of their planning consent, of which there are a, specific, a significant number on this site. Members, I've spoken to Honorary Alderman True Love, who is mentioned in the report as calling this in. Um, he cannot recall when he called, at what stage he referred this application to committee, but it could be as much as three years ago. So why has it taken all this time to be reported to us at committee? Indeed, Councillor Cheeseman and I, um, and indeed yourselves, may never have um, been aware of this calling had it not raised, had I not raised the issue of Lidbrook Close with officers recently. And this matter could have slipped through the net and been approved under delegated powers. Members, Councillor Cheeseman and I feel that um, it would not be appropriate to decide this application this evening as trying to judge differences in levels on this site is virtually impossible by just looking at a few photographs. I would therefore propose a site visit. This would allow members of this committee to properly judge the scale of this and other issues on the site, and also allow the completion of the ongoing enforcement investigation and the meeting I requested with the officers and moat housing to take place. And for a full proper application to be made and a thorough report be brought before this committee at a future date. I hope I have a seconder for this proposed site visit. Thank you, members. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clark. Before I ask if you have a seconder, can I just get some clarity from the planning officer? Um, you mentioned the fallback position, which is the existing planning permission that they've already got. I understand that's not what's on the ground. So if they wanted to fall back to the existing planning permission, they would have to, um, well, I guess, demolish houses. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. I can't see any other way that they'd be able to. Now, you did also say that if new planning permission was given now, they would be required to meet more stringent um, planning conditions than their original planning condition? Yeah, obviously policies evolved and we have different policies in place um, now that, you know, than we did back in the late 90s. And is this planning application subject to the planning conditions of now or the um, the requirements of the 90s? Well, the the effect of granting um, permission um, as a minor material amendment is that a new decision notice is issued. In this instance, that decision notice would relate to the reserve matters application that was granted in 2001, which piggy which will still piggyback onto the outline planning permission that was granted in 1997. And obviously, a reserve matters application can only consider very specific 
points in any case because it's it reserve matters are sighting appearance scale landscaping and access so it doesn't go to the sort of principle the heart of the principle of development it would only be those those matters that would be for um, consideration under reserve matters but they would be more stringent now than they were back in 2001 so if a new if a new proposal had been submitted now it would be under more stringent requirements even under reserve matters than was at the time well if it was if it, if it was a if it was a full application or an outline application it would be subject to current policies um if it was a reserve matters application Yes, there might possibly be other conditions that were attached, but it would still be limited to conditions that reflect that related to reserve matters only, not the principle of a development. Could you have a second of the site visit? Councillor Golding. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to the site visit? Councillor Booth. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's always very difficult um, to view something that isn't there um, it will be impossible to visualize an increased height um, of the land as proposed whether it's there or not um, i find it uh, an inappropriate use of council time and money so no i won't be voting in okay. favor anybody else Okay, those in favour of site visit, please show. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Well, it's only down the road from Norwood, isn't it? So, those against, two, and abstentions, two. Okay, so that's been deferred for a site visit. Um, right, we now move. Would you like us to take a 15 minute break? Let's see, what is it? It's only half eight now. I have to wait until nine o'clock, I think. For that. OK. Uh, 3.1, um, 23 slash 502, 500 slash full, the Faversham War Memorial, Stone Street, Faversham. Are we taking 312 together? Okay, we're going to have a joint presentation on 3.1 and 2, and then we will take 3.1 and the speakers and make a decision, then 3.2. Over to you, Paul. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. There's a there's a short update um, in respect to the planning application for the um, the application, which bear with me. Sorry, I'm not even sharing it. Okay. So yeah, this is a, this is a planning application for the relocation of the existing Faversham War Memorial to the centre of the Memorial Garden, um, including the formation of a new proposed new peace corner comprising interpretation boards with local reflections, raised bed for planting wooden crosses, crosses on site of the existing War Memorial base and associated access path, removal of iron railings cutting into the holly tree, repair and relaying of existing paving and additional repairs to the existing base. So that's what covers the planning application element of it. The listed building consent element is just related to the relocation of the existing War Memorial into the Memorial Garden. Um, I'll cover all the points in, in respect to the application now. Um, so the site is... Hang on, sorry Paul. There's a lot of movement, there's a lot of talking. I'm going to ask the officer to start again and can people actually listen this time, please? Sorry Paul, can you start again? From the top? From the top. Okay. 
So this is, this is an application for planning, um, planning permission and listed building consent. Um, the planning application covers the following. So the relocation of the war memorial to the centre of the memorial garden, um, including the formation of a proposed new peace corner, comprising interpretation boards with local reflections, raised bed for planting wooden crosses on site of existing war memorial base and associated access path, removal of iron railings cutting into the holly tree, repair and relaying of existing paving and additional repairs to the existing base. Um, so that, that covers the planning application. Um, the listed building consent therefore just relates to the relocation of the existing war memorial to the centre of the memorial garden. Um, there's an update for the planning application. Um, and the update is that the, the War Memorial Trust, um, who have commented on the listed building consent application, have um, subsequent to the drafting of the report also provided comments on the planning application. But they're essentially the same comments that are included in the report for the listed building consent. Um, so no further sort of comment needed in terms of in terms of that because it's it's covered essentially under the listed building consent application um, and for the for the planning application there's been two more objections received um, and these are raising points which are already covered in the report so I won't elaborate on that either um, the final thing to mention in the update is that or in the sorry introduction is that there's been an application uh, sorry an appeal against non-determination of the applications for both of these. So what we're considering tonight is how we are going to approach the appeal in terms of whether we defend it for the reasons as out in the report or um, or whether we don't don't defend it. Um, moving into moving into the specific specifics of the application. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the site, but um, for those of you that aren't, it's um, it's on the junction of Roman Road and Stone Street in Faversham. Um, outlined in in red there, um, and there's the there's the aerial view of that of that same um, same part of the same part of the town showing the site. Yeah. Um. So current situation is that. The memorial garden has been um, remodelled fairly recently. Now includes an oval path around it with um, stone plinths and and benches. The war memorial sits in its original location in the in the corner of the site. It's an elevation of the war memorial, but I'll I'll show pictures shortly, which will um, provide some more detail. Again, there's the elevations of it. Again, um, the, so the proposal is to move the war memorial here into the center, well, into, into the memorial garden. Um, the proposal also includes this access path on this side of the site and the what I referred to as the peace corner earlier, which would have um, some boards which would set out the, you know, relevant historical information um, and the removal of the railings which goes around the, the holly tree which again I'll show you on the photograph shortly. This provides just information showing that the uh, war memorial is currently on the corner and is proposed to go to go into the garden as we've just seen. Um, here's a closer view of the proposals in the area which would replace the more the war memorial um, as set out in the application, which is the which is the access path here from from the existing path that's in the gardens, um, and then there's the the raised beds for um, wooden crosses and wartime history boards as well. Um, and here's an elevational view of, of that part of the site as as is proposed. With the boards and the the raised the raised planter there, um, so the photographs of the site. Um, so here's the memorial that's on the on the corner there. Um, obviously quite quite prominent where it is at the moment. Here's a just from the other side the same view. So this is the remodelled memorial garden, and it's proposed to go in fr in front of this um, uh, this stone here, the largest one. 
that's um, obviously in the central part towards the back of the garden. So this looks from where the from where the memorial was proposed to be relocated back towards the um, the current location, which in that photo is hidden by that mature holly tree. And that's looking the other way. Back towards the memorial where you can see it this time. And a final one of it taken from um, from Stone Street. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as per the um, the reports, the the officer recommendation is for um, is that the council defends the um, the appeal uh, for the reasons set out in the in those reports. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I ask for uh, Councillor Rob Cray for the Faversham Town Council, please? Sorry, Councillor Henderson. Sorry, I don't know whether it's appropriate to ask a question now or later. Can I understand why we have or how we have allowed ourselves to get into the position where it has not been decided and therefore this is not actually a decision of the council but it is a it is an idea of what we would have said if we'd been in a position to do so that's a fair point can we have an explanation as to why we are in non-determination territory please well the um the answer is that we won't we've obviously we've gone past the eight weeks for determination and they've taken taken that decision the, the reason is um we were in discussions with them regarding sort of our likely recommendation and um, asking whether they, whether they wish to withdraw the application. Um, they asked for more time to consider and we said OK. And but within that period, they, they appealed, um, which which they had the right. They had the right to do. Um, I mean, if we you know, if we decide that we'll defend the appeal, we'll, we'll effectively be in the same position as if we'd have refused the application. Um, ourselves and they and they appealed that decision you know we we won't be disadvantaged um going into an appeal in on that basis unless we ask for site visit right uh councillor quayford uh, uh thank you chair so feversham town council strongly objects to the ongoing attempts to relocate the town's war, war memorial the location of the memorial is significant for over 100 years, this memorial has stood on the corner of Stone Street and Roman Road, enabling a Faversham residents to remember and honour the fallen on a daily basis. The proposed new location will make the memorial less visible and will not fulfil the original intention of being a daily reminder for local residents. Furthermore, it is Grade 2 listed, and if moved, there is a danger that it will be damaged, desecrating the memory of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. This application gives no guarantee that the, that the memorial could not be moved without damage. The town council supports the view that war memorials should only be moved when absolutely necessary. There seems to be no valid reason to risk damage, especially considering that the current location is part of the original design and aligns with the wishes of previous generations. A similar application was made and refused in 2016. The refusal highlighted the historical and cultural importance of the location and the risk of damage. There appears to be no new valid reasons to overturn the previous objection. We are pleased that the Faversham Society, the War Memorial Trust and Swell's own plan officers strengthens our objections to these applications. We therefore urge all members of this committee to respect the memory of our fallen and the numerous stakeholder groups by appealing the, uh, the objection and well fighting the appeal and ensuring that the war memorial is protected and it, it's not prone to damage. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And can I ask Jonathan Carey, who is from the Favisham Society?
you press the long button with a red uh, red sticker on it, and then you have three minutes. You'll get a 30 second warning when you're running Thank out of you. time. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Carey, and I'm a trustee of the Faversham Society. As a society, it's our responsibility to represent the views of our members. And the fact that is that from them, we have received a considerable number of strongly held views against the current proposals and only one or two comments in support. Our continued formal objection to the proposal therefore summarizes the clear majority view of our membership. We object strongly to this listed building consent application on two grounds process and the treatment of a grade two listed structure. Despite the changes um, in detail, this proposal is fundamentally unaltered from that which rightly was refused by this committee in 2016 when there were 74 letters of objection. We thus very much welcome your officer's clear and unequivocal recommendation that the current application also be refused. Our forebears decided to cite the Memorial Cross on the corner of Stone Street and Roman Road in what was the Cottage Hospital's garden, not a war memorial garden. The Society submits that the decision of the bereft generation to cite the cross on that corner should be respected. This setting is fundamental to the cross's historic significance. This is not the time for me to go into the detail contained in our written submission to the planning portal in early June, but suffice it to say that we do not accept the applicant's statement that the visual prominence of the cross has declined. The fact that some other memorials may have been moved does not make it any more acceptable to do the same thing here. Memorials are not playthings. Moving listed buildings devalues their authenticity and the applicant's statement does not provide sufficient justification to overcome the national planning policy requirement that their quotes must be a compelling justification for relocation. Nor has the applicant established that it's necessary for structural reasons to move the cross. Despite the applicant's value, the society believes it's perfectly acceptable, even desirable, that the Armistice Day service should involve a short, short-term road closure. Ownership of the garden, where the cross was placed in 1922, was transferred from the Cottage Hospital trustees to Faversham Borough in 1948. 30 seconds. And thence to Swale Borough in 1974. Swale Borough Council is, we therefore assert, the owner and thus responsible for holding the cross in trust for the people of Faversham. The membership and constitution of the applicant committee are unknown. We do not accept that this, is a, that this apparently self-appointed group, seemingly accountable to no one, has the right to alter or move this listed structure, which is cited where it is and constructed by those who suffered loss and maiming in two world wars. Thank you. Thank you. Could the officer just clarify on that point, that the, even if this planning permission was given, that there's no, uh, no certainty over ownership, so it might not be actually even be capable of being implemented? I don't know in terms of the the ownership and who's who has the right. That wouldn't be something we um, consider as part of the the applications. Okay, I'll move the officer's recommendation, seconded by Councillor Booth. Um, actually, I did it the wrong way around that time, but I'll ask the ward member, Cal Jacks, Councillor Jackson, to speak. Thank you, Chair. My comments encompass both the both applications. I'm speaking in favour of the officer's recommendation to reject this proposal. As a ward councillor in particular, I want to represent the views of the local residents who live in the neighbouring streets. They are overwhelmingly opposed to further upheaval at this site. And many of them echo the views of the War Memorial Trust that as much as possible an existing memorial should stay where it is, that moving it is a high risk and that decisions on moving it should be made by the local community. In this case, the immediate, the immediate local community the Town Council and the Faversham Society are all opposed to the proposal. While some seem supporters come from beyond the town and even as far away as Cambridge. The cross and the holly tree were donated by Faversham residents beside the peaceful garden and which they feel now has been ruined by recent developments, desecrating the memory of those who set up the memorial originally. 
A volunteer tree warden has commented that it's unnecessary to cut the holly tree, which gives shade, and we should be keeping trees, not cutting them down. Please support the officer's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Anybody wish to speak? Sorry, Councillor Thompson, you weren't in for the whole debate. I didn't do it. Did you get in before we redid it? Oh, lucky you. Off Councillor Thompson. No, I was just agreeing with those sentiments, but I feel that when something's listed, it's the environment in which it's in, um, the tree, the setting, and therefore it, it creates that story. So to move it would be, for me, changing the whole reason to list it in the first place. So that's just my point. And the tree as well doesn't need trimming. It's a grand tree, actually. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Yeah. Um, I'm appalled, absolutely appalled. I sat here, or actually over that side, um, in 20, uh, 2016, when we went through this entire process again. There was a, uh, a book for comments in Parisham Library. The, there was a presentation by the people wishing to make this change that there had been strongly comments in favour of it. No one was allowed to see that document afterwards and uh, photos were taken of it while it was in place, which demonstrated that actually people were strongly against moving the war memorial. Um, and indeed, quite strongly against the uh, uh, the whole new presentation that we have now. Uh, the War Memorial Society, is that the right name, was strongly against because they believed that the War Memorial could be damaged if it were moved. And given that it's been there 101 years, that seems to me very likely. And if you talk to people around Faversham, I certainly have not been able to find more than 10%, and that's at a maximum, of people who wanted to have an interest in it being in favour of moving the war memorial. Uh, I, I, I simply do not think that the application should be valid and the, the point about uh, ownership has been made. And indeed, if you look at the... Um, Sorry, let me find the right place. Um, the applicant for this is down here as Mr. Mike Cosgrove. Now, Mr. Mike Cosgrove is a long time um, member of this council uh, and is therefore uh, an alderman of, of this council but clearly does not have any rights of ownership and therefore of change of Faversham Town's War Memorial. And uh, I, I certainly would plead with this council that it must not be moved because it could result in damage. It must not be moved because the townspeople of Faversham do not want it moved. 
and it should not be moved because the ownership is in doubt and uh, uh, I, I do not see that uh, it can be moved unless the ownership can be proven. So uh, I, uh, I hope we can get um, a, a unanimous decision to uh, oppose this uh, um, suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Marchington, we've heard quite a lot of uh, reasons. So can, can we avoid duplication or repetition, please? Councillor Marchington. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's a question I need to ask. Um, on Remembrance Day, on the 11th day, hour and 11th, day, the 11th month, how many people stand in front of this to view the silence and the lane of the reefs? And would there be room in that small garden if you've got people in the streets marched up because everyone will have to see on that day. And that's critical, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor March. And that's a good point, which I'm not sure officers are going to be able to answer, but maybe if somebody does know, they can contribute. Over 100. I laid the wreath this year and we laid it at the new memorial, but people in company. Uh, right, to keep people in the committee speaking. Uh, Councillor Booth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I concur with the majority of uh, comments that uh, Councillor Henderson made. I was in exactly the same chamber at exactly the same time. Um, and also an, an honorary alderman of this uh, of this borough. Um, I think uh, sometimes we see applications that are absolutely crystal clear uh, with regards to the officer of recommendation. Um, I think we need to dwell very little on this and support the officer recommendation. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more speakers. So those in favour of the officer recommendation to refuse, please show. Are we happy to do this for 3.1 and 3.2 together? Yes. <laughs> OK, this is for 3.1 and 3.2, uh, so it's unanimous. Thank you. OK, we've come to the end of the speakers. People are a bit itchy, so we'll take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and finish the agenda.
Okay, are we all back? Do you want to start again? Okay, then. So we go back to item 2.1, which is 23 slash 503 435 slash full Faversham 57 Ospringe Road. Can I have the officer update, please? Yeah, thanks, Chairman. No update for this one. Um, so I'll, then I'll present the, um, the item. Um, so the applications for the erection of a two-storey side and orangery and orangery extension, installation of replacement railings to the front boundary, installation of replacement windows to the cellar to the front elevation and to the playroom to the side elevation, installation of solar panels to the lower roofs to the rear of the existing dwelling. So let's just state the site. The site is in Ospringe Road, so um, very much within the built-up area of Faversham. So here's the is the house here so you can see it's got a an existing um quite lengthy projection to the rear um and uh quite a good sized garden as well um so that's the basically that's the plan view of, of what we've just looked on the aerial image this is the existing elevation of the property so a traditionally designed um property in faversham um which has been so which does have um projections to the rear as existing and that shows it on the on the plan form there so the proposal I'll zoom in on that two story side extension going here orangery extension here um solar panels on the on the rear elements of the of the property um and changes to the railings and the brick wall at the front, which I'll show on a separate drawing shortly. Um, elevations. So front elevation with the two storey side extension, um, which has been amended during the course of the application. There was um, there was some sort of concern in terms of the detailing of the of the roof was um, was different to the existing dwelling. So that's been amended after discussions between the um, between officers and the and the agent and is considered it now sits quite comfortably on that on that front elevation. Um, from the rear, you can see the obviously the extent two story extension there with the with the orangery extension, which which comes off of the um, the rear projection, the existing rear projection. So this is as viewed from the side. And here's the um, the floor plans of that. So the I'll zoom in again. So here's the side extension, obviously ground floor and first floor there, and the the orangery at the back. And the the wall and the railings that I was talking about. So there'd be a slight increase in the height of the wall, and then the replacement of the existing railings with heritage style railings, and a gate. Photographs. So here we are, front elevation. So side extension going in the gap here. And they'd still they'd, um, they'd remain a one meter gap between the side elevation of, of that property there and the side elevation of the new extension. Um, see, the, see the existing railings there. Um, so the changes officers think in terms of the railings will be a will be an enhancement. Um, and then at the back. So the orangery will come off essentially for this side wall here and the extension will, the, sorry, the two story extension will fill the majority of, of that gap there. Um, we dealt with a similar application um, 
as set out in the in the history section. But that proposal also included um, an access and a hard standing at the front of the property, which was which was refused. Um, but it was only essentially refused for um, on the basis of elements of the scheme, which now don't form part of this application. So all the other elements of the scheme that were previously considered as being being acceptable are essentially the same, aside from some small what I'd consider to be enhancements to the detailing of the extension. Um, and for those reasons, officers recommend approval as per the report. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move the officer's report. Thank you, Councillor Booth. Councillor Winkless. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I did pay a visit uh, this morning, uh, along with the ward councillor Jackson, actually, uh, looking from the road side of it, um, in my usual brief, short fashion. Uh, I can't really see it's going to create that much of a problem with this extension, so I'll regard the officer's recommendations. OK, let's see any other hands. So those in favour of the application, please show. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Those against? One. That one's carried. You didn't didn't have a conviction that your your um speech would change our minds then. <laughs> okay, then we shall move on quickly to two point three, which is twenty three slash five oh one four five two slash full Scockles Farm. Minister 1C, can we have the officer's update, please? Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, there's no update, so I'll go straight to the presentation. Um, so um, there's there's a little bit of history on, on this site. Um, planning permission has been granted in recent years for nine dwellings, and nine dwellings have been constructed. There's also permission here for um, residential development as well. And Scockles Court here is a grade two listed building. Sites in the built confines of Minster, um, but sits in a quite prominent position right on the edge of the settlement boundary. Um, the, um, the scheme that was permitted, um, the, the development has essentially taken place, um, but the dwellings um, were not built um, in accordance with the approved plans, um, particularly the aesthetic appearance of the dwellings. Um, a planning application was submitted two years ago um, for those unauthorised changes, and a lot of those changes simplified the appearance of the buildings, um, and that was refused by planning committee, and some members may, may recall that. Um, the applicant then subsequently um, made changes to plots two to seven, which are these ones here, um, and reverted those back to the approved plans. So those are all fine. Plots eight to nine, which are here, the applicant made a revised application to make a more limited range of changes to those properties, mm -hmm. and they were approved. And so that now leaves us with plot one, which is here um, and the just to show members that's the that's the approved plans for plot one um, and the application proposes to make a number of more limited changes to the the property I say proposes those changes are are retrospective um, but the application also makes clear that the applicant intends to retrofit a number of architectural features and details that were shown on the approved plans um, to the property. Um, these are the proposed plans and the key changes are um, that the roof has gone from a barn hip to a gable. Um, there has been some minor changes to the window fenestration. Um, the porch has um, become slightly wider and there have been some internal changes um, to enlarge the utility area and make the garage smaller but that doesn't actually affect the amount of car parking space that's available within the garage. Um, 
that is the property at the moment. Um, what I'll just quickly do is show you. So this was the property as it was originally constructed. Um, and um, part of the reason that members um, refused the application um, for the changes um, were, as I said earlier, the sort of bland elevations that were created. So this cladding's been removed now and tile hanging's been reinstated. Um, and the windows, which should have been oak effect windows, but were originally um, installed as UPVC windows, they have been changed to oak effect windows. Um, the, the applicant has committed to um, to revert back to a number of further detailed changes that were part of the approved plan. So there is a dental course that will be retrofitted here underneath the tile hanging, um, exposed rafter feet to the eaves of both the main house and the garage. The cheeks of the dormers will be clad um, and window bars will be added to the um, to the dwellings. And they're shown on the approved plans. Um, so in that respect, there's no change between um, the plans that are in front of members now and the original plans. So this application is essentially for change to the roof, barn hip to gable, slight widening of the porch um, and some very minor changes to to the windows. Um, the second change is to a footway. Um, so if I go back to the site plan, this was the approved site plan. There was a footway coming into the site on both sides. This footway hasn't been built um, and instead the boundary to this plot has been made slightly wider. Uh, KCC highways don't have any concern about the loss of that path, partly because there is a footway on the other side and partly because the um, the development serves a, a limited number of properties, so they haven't identified any any concerns in terms of highway safety. Um, the changes that are proposed, um, we've consulted with the conservation officer, given the um, uh, relationship of the site with Scockles Court. Um, he's satisfied that this more limited range of changes are acceptable and the recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'll move the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Booth. Councillor Booth. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, it's been made mention of this evening already. I find it quite disappointing that the only reason we're seeing this is because the Parish Council have uh, objected. Uh, it is a complete and utter waste of our time because they haven't even bothered to turn up this evening to make formal representation. I beg we move straight to the vote. Well, I'm a bit concerned about this vanishing pathway. Um, if you can you just pop that back up, please, Paul. Now, the proposal had a footpath that from these houses in the middle and diagonally, you could walk out, walk round, you didn't have to cross over. Now there is no footpath there. And you're going to have to cross. It just requires people to cross roads unnecessarily. Um, I think that is a bit of a cheek. I, I think that okay, KCC might be happy with it from a highway perspective, but from a residential amenity perspective, um, you're actually taking a, you you're taking away a safety feature. I'm a little bit concerned about. It. I don't like the change in the look of the house either, but. I think if it had come through as it is, we probably would have agreed it. But that la that loss of a footpath does concern me. But if I'm on my own, and that will move on. Any anybody else wish to speak on this? Councillor Hunt. I think on the footpath you're on your own. I think on the footpath you're on your own. Um, but not not with the design of the house because I. I think having those hips make a real big difference. And when you've got housing opposite that's got the hips on as well, um, those were put on there for a reason for design. And when you look at it, how it's say proposed or how it's been built now, it's just a square mass and it does make a big difference to that design. Um, 
I personally would push back and get get those changes. Uh, but it's how it, it sits in with the rest of the houses. So that photo there, how it sits in with the rest of the housing in the area. But do, do we have a photo of the housing opposite that has got the hip? Oh. Yes, it just makes it look so different. I don't actually like the house either without that roof. And you can see there how much a footpath would have benefited. Do we have a, any idea why they built the entire estate wrongly? <laughs> I, I, I don't know the backgrounds behind why they why they departed from the approved plans. Councillor Hunt. I just thought, has there been discussions about the roof? Because I know it's not an easy thing to to change, um, but have they been asked to to put the roof right as it was, or is it just been considered that actually it's acceptable and there's no need to ask them? Um, we've had a lot of discussions with the um, with the applicant, um, and obviously we've taken on board um, the advice from our conservation officer as well. Um, and whilst we were keen to ensure that a certain number of features were um, retrofitted to the to the scheme. Um, we didn't consider that the barn hip was was essential and that was the, the view of the, the conservation officer as well. It does look a bit of a dog's breakfast though, doesn't it? It's neither one thing or another. You don't have photos of the other of the other house opposite. There's, and while it's setting, you know. Yeah, well, you can you can see, um, so you can see there um, the house with the clay style roof in the distance. That's part of the development, which has a, a gable roof. Um, and then if I move here, you can see the that's plots eight and nine um, within the development, which which obviously do have a hip. But you've you've obviously got a mix of gable and hipped roofs within within the site itself um, and um, the new development um, within Thistle Hill surrounding that you can just see a property behind the um, behind plots eight and nine here which you can see also have gable roofs as well. We should come back. I wish I could, but I don't think it's strong enough to object to, to make an objection to it um, because there's so many different things, but I, I don't like it, but I don't think there's any reason to refuse it. Okay. Councillor Marchington. Yeah, thank you, Chair. The fact that um, it's a large house and it's um, a new house, it, it doesn't, it's not really trying to keep in with anybody else, in my opinion. I think it looks quite good as it is. and, and uh, if that had come to us and that form, I'd have voted for it then. And I'm prepared to vote for it now. Thank you. OK, I see no more hands. So those in favour of the officer's recommendation to approve? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 2, 12. Those against? Three. I think that's carried. So the next one tonight is item 2.6. Which is 22 slash 505 369 slash full. Ah, uh, yes. The RAF master at Courtney Road, Dunkirk. Officer update, please. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Um, no update for this one. I, I mean, unless you want me to, I won't go through the presentation before from the previous um, committee. So this came to committee um, last month, wasn't it? Yeah, time flies. Um, 
with a recommendation for approval and uh, members resolve to approve the application. It's for a, for a data storage facility, um, just as a reminder. Um, it was approved um, subject to the inclusion, inclusion of conditions requiring the generator to be battery powered rather than diesel powered and the inclusion of solar PV panels. Um, post the committee, um, officers, um, obviously outlined to the agent what had happened at the committee and they came back with concerns, particularly in relation to the generator being um, battery powered rather than diesel powered um, for the comments as set out in the report. Um, officers sought the advice of the council's climate change officer who agreed with what the agent said. Um, and on that basis, officers went back to the agent and um, suggested that if they couldn't include those matters that they include an uplift or or we recommend an uplift in the um briam condition to very good instead of good which is the policy requirement um so the proposal before members tonight is for the same scheme but for um for the two points which members um requested last time not to be included but in place of that for the briam condition to be amended to very good um, which officers consider is a sort of reasonable alternative on the basis that the the generators would only be used at times when the when there was a power cut, um, so infrequently. Whereas the Briam condition will be, you know, related to how the building is constructed and then how it's operated um, in perpetuity. So that's seen as a sort of, well, it's seen as a gain in terms of um, in terms of sustainability. Um, yeah, for those reasons, the the recommendation. Um, is that the application is approved subject to the conditions including that amendment. Thank you. OK, I'll move the Office of the Recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Booth. Seconding, anybody wish to speak on this? Councillor Booth. Yeah, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, the only point I wish to make is on the uh, the BRIAM, very good. Uh, I would urge officers, I know it's a condition, but I would urge officers to stand by their guns. Uh, and when the applicant comes back and says, I can't actually afford that, I'm going to go down to good. We say get stuffed. It's actually very good. Thank you. Anybody else? OK, then I'll move to the officer's recommendation. Those in favour, please show. OK, thank you. That is unanimous. I think now we're just on to the part five items. Does anybody wish to say anything about the part fives? Oh, well, you're right, Councillor Hunt. If I, we could have got it done, then that's all my thing. Okay, well, thank you all and uh, safe journeys home. Don't get too cold. <laughs>